Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Sanders, and this is Watch Art Sci, the art and science of watch collection. Uh, today, what we're going to talk about is tracking down the source of your movement, the origins of your movement. And sometimes this can be very tricky, and in my case, I'm trying to find the source of my Christian von der Klaus series 1974, was exactly that. The uh, the first thing about this was that I, I found that the movement was based on, in fact, it was pretty much a Soprod A10. And, but I didn't really know too much about the Soprod A10. I had heard it was a clone of an ETA 2892 and a lot of other kinds of things. I'd heard it was a really special upscale uh, movement, but I really didn't know too much about it. And so I thought, well, this will be a good time to to track it down and, and find out. Now, I did call the uh, the folks in uh, the Netherlands at uh, Christian van der Klaal. I said, What's, what do you got in your watch? And I said, I heard it said it's so proud A10, and that, that's right. He said the uh, we added a, a little claw to it on the rotor, and and uh, we added a little identification number to it. But she said it's uh, it was an A10. So well, that was that was good to hear. I mean, there wasn't any kind of any oh excuses like oh well you know or how great it was. That's what we use. Okay, well, I, I knew that Kristen uh, van der Klaus had other movements that they made themselves that were in-house. They had one called the, uh, they had three of them that were listed. One was a 7382, which was for their three-dimensional moon, which is the most accurate moon watch in the world. <laughs> really amazing, or the three-dimensional one. They had another one called the 7383, and then they had another one called the uh, 7386. Since then, they've added some new ones. The 82 and the 83 were for the what's called the real moon jour. And it's a little three-dimensional moon. It turns, and you can see the different shadows on it, on the different moon phases. The the 86 is an amazing one. That's the world's smallest planetarium on a <laughs> on a on a mechanical watch. Uh, the same one was on Van Cleef's and Arpel's uh, award-winning watch that they won the Grand Prix d'Or de DJ Genev. At least they, they, I forgot which category it was, but they, they're they're quite good. I mean, there's not some kind of Rudy Poo <laughs> kind of a thing is throwing in an ETA and uh, calling it uh, in-house. Okay. All right. So, but in this case, they were using uh, somebody else's uh, movement, the Soprod A10. Well, the the first thing I heard was that, well, it's a, a clone of the ETA 2892. Well, it wasn't a clone, and it was never uh, meant to be a clone. It was, it was meant to be a replacement. And to be a replacement, you have to have the same width, the same height, and the holes for the what are called uh, dial feet. Uh, on your dial, there are two little posts, and you have, and then you have holes for them on the movement. Put them in the holes tighten the screws and that locks it in. And you have to have those, those are the minimum that you need to have. And you can replace literally any other movement that's made for that size case. Now, uh, you they also, since it was going to be a replacement for the 2892, they wanted to make it automatic and they also wanted to have a date function for it, or at least the option of a date function. All right, so let's see. The difference between a replacement and a clone is that a clone basically copies everything in the movement and uses it. The uh, ones I've been working with, I've been working with an ETA, ETA Unitas 6497 and 98, and 
most of the ones that I've been working with, because I tend to break them, <laughs> I can't afford to, are the Siegel version of the same thing. And they are a clone, period. No two ways about it. They're, they have the same everything in it. And so if you want to find out how to work on one, you simply look up the specs for the 64, 97, or 98 and get the ST36. And that's how they work with them. So that's what a what a clone is. Okay, so um, the from what I heard, uh, this the Soprod wasn't a clone. So how do you find out whether something's a clone or not? Well, what I did is that I I got the uh, specs for each one of them and took a look at them. And just on the first look, you can <laughs> you can tell they don't look the same. And uh, there are similar things. There's going to be similar things in every uh, mechanical watch, just about. But just right away, it was, it was something else was going on. The Soprod A10 wasn't the 2892, even though it had the same width, the same height, and the same uh, dial uh, holes, plus it was automatic. And it had a date window. Okay, so... Uh, what I did is that I started looking around and I found out that in 2004, there was a deal between Seiko and Soprod. Soprod bought the iBosch for something that was called the 4L. It was either called the 4L or the 4L25 back in 2004. And that relationship didn't last too long. Because shortly after that, Soprod was bought by a, a Chinese company uh, based in Hong Kong. And this made Seiko nervous. They didn't want to have the Chinese with their technology. And so they cut off, they cut off the sales to them. And so that was it. I mean, there was a, they, they gave the specs and everything to Soprod in the in the iBosch so that they could make their own what came to be the Soprod A10. All right. Well, so what about this 4L? Well, this was an early attempt by Seiko to have an upscale high horology watch. And he came out with these line of watches, uh, S-A-R-A, -A, uh, Sara. Uh, and they had a, a number of them, I don't know, four or five, something like that. And they were gorgeous watches. They had this really nice Elo Shea and just really nice watches, but they were a flop. And the reason they were a flop is that there was a sticker, a sticker shock. Most people who bought Seikos were not looking for a high horology watch. They wanted an everyday, inexpensive watch. Well, they, got a, they were bumped up significantly over what they had been. And so, the from 2007 for a few years they had and they just were, they didn't work. So boom, they were dropped. Now the the idea was was to have a something between your everyday Seiko and your Grand Seiko, and this was was what the idea of the Sara was. Didn't work out. They came back again back in uh, just last year in 2018 was something called the 4L75, and they had it in certain models of uh, Creators. And they, the thing was really hard to tag that down because it, it seems that Seiko makes a new movement <laughs> whenever they feel, I think on their lunch breaks, they make a new one. They have this incredible amount of talent at Seiko, so making uh, and designing <laughs> new watch movements doesn't seem to be a, a, a problem. So anyway... But this one was identified as basically the 4L, and they, with a few changes to it, but not a lot. It's essentially the same 4L that came out and that was sold as an Ibosh in 2004 to um, Soprod. Okay. Well, now the so the next thing I wanted to do, I wanted to compare Soprod with the Seiko 4L25. And... The thing that I, I wanted to look at, now, if, if you take a, a, a movement with an iBosch, the iBosch can have barely nothing to it. It can have the plates and maybe the uh, gear train without the uh, escapement, or it can have a lot more to it. 
and so I wasn't sure. So I I I I, I got some pictures of the one that was in my watch, the Sopard uh, A10, and then compared it with this, the uh, Seiko 4L25. And they were different, uh, if, if you look at them, they're, but uh, they're going to be different because you have a, a different uh, balance cock, uh, looks a little different, and the regulator is a little different, but it's, it's on the other hand, it's not that different. Okay, I mean when you when you when you consider it, they both deal with a screw moving the uh, regulator left and right. Okay, so there's not a lot of difference, um, but there's some. So I wasn't sure, and so I uh, just kept looking. Now, uh, the one of the places that I, I sort of got the best evidence possible that the A10 was a uh, Seiko 4L25 was Mark Lovick's <laughs> in his watch repair. Now, being a pretentious watchmaker, I, I, I like to watch uh, Mark Lovick because this guy knows he's so good with it. He just takes watches apart and puts them back together. So th the the name of the video he had was called Strip Down Seiko 4L25 Dash Soprod A10. In other words, it was the same one. And uh, so that was sort of, what I had suspected, I had heard, the, the the guys on the forums, they, they, they hear a rumor and treat it as a fact sometimes. Uh, some of the information is great, some of it's terrible, and so I was had to get through all of that. And I think the thing that gave me a total confidence that everything was as it should be was I mean that that the A10 was based on a, a Seiko 4L25 was Mark Lovick's uh, video on a repair. All right, they uh, so I went to, uh, to Soprod. I thought, well, I'm going to see what Soprod's up to now. <laughs> they don't. They there were all of these links to Soprod and the A10, but what I found instead was the M100. Uh, in fact, I found nothing where there was supposed to be an A10. So I, I looked around and I found it. Here it was in the M100. You can tell by the specs and everything, that's what it was. Except now they have three different types of M100, formerly A10. One of them is the one that's in my watch. It's, this is uh, this is the watch and it has it, two little pullouts. There's in all the way and then you pull it out just a little and that is... That changes the moon phase, or on this one, the date, and then you pull it all out all the way, and that changes the hour and the uh, minute hands. Uh, there's another one that uh, is is only time only, no date, and it's called it's called the Balancier Visible. Probably said it wrong, but there is. And then there's a final one, is a uh, skeletonized one. And so you have, th from a single A10, you now have the M100 in, in three different versions. And the one that uh, that's now what is the A10, or was, was on the A10, is the M100 date. Okay, so if you're wondering what, where it is now, that's where it is. All right, finally, um, and... In looking at my watch, I thought, well, what I better do is put it into a time grapher and see how well this thing is. Is that it was advertised as being a entry level high horology by Seiko. And so I, on the time grapher, I'm like, God, it was incredible. The, and this, had, this watch had been, it was purchased in the Netherlands, sent to uh, the Middle East. And then it was sent to the U.S. The thing had been bounced around a lot, and the it was amazing. Uh, the rate uh, was minus 0.1 seconds a day, which is is not only excellent; it's, it's almost perfect. The beat error was 0 0.1 of a millisecond. The amplitude was 311. Now 311 is just a skosh high. Uh, I, the, sort of the 310 is the upper limit for excellent. Uh, it's certainly within the acceptable range. Now, I used a lift angle of 51. 
And that's the only thing I have I'm a little hesitant about. That I'm not absolutely sure about. And I, I did uh, write to um, Kristen Vanderclaw to find out if that's the right lift angle. If not, I, I'll adjust it and then run it again. But anyway, so this was sort of my story about how I ran down what was in my watch. And I sometimes you can't, you know, as much as the guys on the forum do their best, <laughs> you never know. Some forums are better than others, and some people on the forums are better than others. But some of them are just sort of way off. So you you have to do a lot of work sometimes to find out what's in your watch. But if you're a watch collector, it's sort of a fun thing to do. Anyway, I would love to hear your comments on this, see what you think. And uh, as always, this is an invitation to subscribe. And until Sunday, this is Bill Sanders for Watch Art Sci, the art and science of watch collection.